The ancient church father Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And from the earliest pages of the Old Testament, clear through the book of Revelation, Satan has indeed persecuted the people of God. When they were slaves in Egypt, Pharaoh schemed to kill all the male children born to Hebrew women. When they were in captivity to the Persian Empire, Haman plotted to kill every Jew in the land. In the second century BC, Antiochus Epiphanes attacked Jerusalem, executing any and all Jews who refused to bow to Zeus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Herod tried to destroy him by slaughtering all the infant boys living in the region. The pages of church history tell of Stephen, who was stoned to death, closely followed by the beheading of the Apostle James. Revelation 2, verse 13, mentions Antipas, a member of the church in Pergamum, who died for his faith. Polycarp, the pastor of the church in Smyrna, was burned at the stake for his refusal to worship Caesar. Many Roman Christians died in the arenas at the hands of the gladiators or in the mouths of lions. Medieval believers endured the Inquisition. The Huguenots and other Protestants were massacred during the Reformation. Hundreds of Chinese believers lost their lives during the Boxer Rebellion. And on through history we could go, citing one story after another of the persecution and the martyrdom of God's people. And don't think for a moment that this oppression and death is just a history lesson. Did you know that more Christ followers have given their lives for their faith in the past 100 years than in all of the other centuries combined? When speaking of such atrocities, we must take special note of God's chosen people, the Israelites. Satan's fury has been unleashed against them from the very beginning to this day. Why such a focus on Israel? Well, Genesis 3 and verse 15 tells us, immediately after the fall, after Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, that was the very first of the promise of the Messiah, Jesus who will crush Satan. And as we discover when that promise is reaffirmed again and again in the Old Testament, Christ would be the offspring of Hebrew and Jewish ancestors. That's why the devil hates Israel. His nemesis, the one who will ultimately defeat him, comes from the Hebrew-Jewish bloodline. And so Satan has always sought to exterminate the Israelites, and so it continues even to our day. If you've ever wondered why there is so much hatred and anti-Semitism directed toward that little nation that is tucked away along the eastern Mediterranean, here's the reason. Satan knows that, that he just despises Israel and everything that is Jewish because he knows that Jesus was born a Jew and that he defeated the devil on the cross and that one day he will return to reign from Jerusalem and ultimately he will cast Satan into the eternal lake of fire. Now Moses himself prophesied very clearly about this anti-Semitism in Deuteronomy chapter 28 says, then the Lord will scatter you among all nations from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. Among those nations, you will find no repose, no resting place for the sole of your foot. There the Lord will give, away, give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing and a despairing heart. You will live in constant suspense, filled with dread both night and day, never sure of your life. In the morning you'll say, oh, if only it were evening. In the evening, if only it were morning. Because of the terror that will fill your hearts and the sights that your eyes will see. Now here in today's text, John tells us that the end of all this is not yet arrived. There will be even more martyrs in the future tribulation. Follow along in your Bible as I read Revelation chapter 6. We pick it up with verse 9. When he, that is the Lamb, Jesus, 
opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them were given a white robe and were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Now, as we work our way through Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11, and the souls under the altar, let's begin by looking at the context of their martyrdom. The context. Let's read Revelation 6 and verse 9 out loud together. Would you read this with me? When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. Now, who are these martyrs? To help us answer that important question, we must first remember that John places them in the future. When the church has already been raptured and the dead in Christ have already been resurrected, so then these martyrs are not from the church age that we are living in right now. Also, since in verse 10 the martyrs ask for judgment on their oppressors on the earth, their murderers are obviously still alive. And so this suggests that the martyrs are faithful saints who are killed during the seven-year tribulation. We should note, I think, at this point in our study of the tribulation, that God will deal intensely with Israel during those seven years. The Apostle Paul indicated in Romans 11, verses 25 and 26, that a partial spiritual blindness has afflicted Israel and will remain in place until the rapture occurs. But after that, during the tribulation, God will again turn his full attention to his chosen people, the Jews. And many Jews will turn to God and reject the Antichrist. And as a result, many will be martyred for their faith. Because of God's turning his attention to his people during the tribulation, I think we can assume that the martyred souls under the altar are, in fact, Jewish Christians. Now, someone's bound to ask this question. So how do they become Christians during the tribulation? I thought all Christians were gone. Well... As we'll soon see when we continue our study, Revelation 11 tells us that God sends two witnesses to preach to these Jews on the earth. And Revelation 7 mentions 144,000 Jews who are going to be sealed for God's service during this same period. In addition, remember, as we leave the earth, we will leave behind copies of the Bible and other Christian literature and media and, and through these means, then, God will provide a witness for the gospel to those who are actually left behind after the rapture. But those who do place their faith in Christ will pay a heavy, heavy price for doing so. Martyrdom. Now, the book of Revelation identifies the enemies of God as those who have shed the blood of his people Jesus spoke of this coming period of intense suffering in Matthew 24 and verses 9 and 10. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Bible scholar Richard Bauckham summarizes martyrdom during the tribulation period with these words, Revelation portrays the future as though all faithful Christians will be martyred. It's not a literal prediction that every Christian will, in fact, be put to death, but it does require that every faithful Christian must be prepared to die. That brings us, then, to the cause of their martyrdom. The cause. Revelation 6, verse 9 tells us that those martyred during the tribulation are killed for exactly the same reason that the Apostle John was exiled to the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. The word of God would, I think, refer to their preaching and teaching of the truths of the Bible. The testimony that they had maintained, that would be in reference to their refusal to deny that Jesus is Lord. Now, we must remember that when the church is raptured, 
the restraint of the Holy Spirit will be removed from this earth, according to 2 Thessalonians 2. And so the carnal and evil desires of unsaved humankind are going to kind of just run free during the tribulation. The rulers of that day will, in fact, target Christ's followers as they vent their anger and rebellion against God. And these Jewish Christians who are publicly preaching and teaching the Word of God and openly professing their testimony that Jesus is Lord, they're going to especially be targeted. Now that brings us to the consequences of their martyrdom. The consequences. Look again at John's description in verse 9. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. Now, as do many pictures in the book of Revelation, this phrase under the altar has its roots, in fact, in the Old Testament. Leviticus 4 and verse 7 says that the blood of a sacrificial bull was to be poured out under or at the base of the altar. And here in Revelation, we find the souls of those martyred for Jesus in the tribulation under the altar in heaven. Now, in his commentary on Revelation, Dr. Donald Barnhouse points out, we are not to think that John had a vision of an altar with souls peeping out from underneath. The whole teaching of the Old Testament is that the altar is to be covered in the sight of God by the merit which Jesus Christ provided in dying on the cross. It is a figure that speaks of justification. These martyred witnesses are covered by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply put, they're saved and they are secured under the blood of the Lamb, Jesus And that brings us then to the cry of their martyrdom. The cry. Look again at verse 10. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Now, this martyr's cry for vengeance is another evidence that they are not church-age sufferers. Because the cry of the church age martyr is the cry of Stephen, the first martyr of the church. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. But those who are persecuted during the tribulation will be able to call for God's judgment because the age of grace, you see, has ended. The tribulation is the day, in fact, of the judgment of God. And so the cry is, how long, sovereign Lord? Surely even in this age of grace. Every one of us as Christians has at some time or another wanted to cry out to God, how long? (laughs) How long before all the suffering and pain and sin and crime and drugs and hatred and abortion and wickedness and evil and all of the rest of the stuff in this awful world are done away with? All of creation groans with the desire to be set free from that which only God, the sovereign Lord, as he's called here in this text, only he has the authority to avenge. And so instead, in this age of grace that we now live, we pray as Christ did, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And yet the time is coming during the tribulation when that cry will change. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our And that brings us then to the comfort of their martyrdom. The comfort. John writes in Revelation 6, verse 11, Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Now, it seems to me that the Lord provides five comforts for these martyred souls. The first of which is refuge. Refuge. Again, the picture of these Jewish Christian martyrs under the altar is a picture of them being covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And surely that is the safest place that anyone could ever be. Refuge. The second comfort is that of a robe. Each of them was given a white robe, verse 11 tells us. Now, this white robe is mentioned many times throughout the book of Revelation. Revelation 7 and verse 14 explains they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These robes are a picture of purity, sinlessness, 
righteousness. And of course, they're only white because they are, in fact, washed in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. It seems from the wording here in verse 11 that each of them was given a white robe. That literally, as each Jewish Christian is martyred, he or she personally and individually is robed by Christ as they arrive in his presence in heaven. Isn't that a great word picture? Robe. The third word of comfort is rest. The phrase in verse 11, wait a little longer, I think could be better translated, rest a little longer. This particular time under the fifth seal is the first of two periods in the tribulation when believers are martyred. The Lord doesn't answer their prayer for vengeance here because the cup of human iniquity is not yet full. He tells them some of your fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, still must suffer death. And it's only when the second contingent of martyrs has been slaughtered that God will act in his judgment. But until then, as these martyrs in Revelation 6 wait, they are told to rest. Now, let's read Revelation 14 and verse 13 out loud together. Would you read this with me? I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. Rest. The fourth comfort that's promised to them is the promise of retribution. From the very same altar, in fact, in heaven, where these martyrs cry out, will eventually come an angel with a sharp sickle. This is the angel of judgment that's sent to avenge these martyrs. Revelation 14, verses 19 and 20 describes this moment of retribution this way. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered his grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia, which, by the way, is about 180 miles picture the gore of that blood up to a horse's bridle 180 miles long this is in fact one of the most graphic depictions of God's wrath against the evil deeds of humanity in all of the Bible but there is coming a retribution for these martyrs and one last comfort that is reward Reward. Of course, these martyred Jewish Christians will be honored in heaven forever, but even before that, they'll be honored during, uh, on the earth during the millennium. John describes his vision of this in Revelation 20 and verse 4. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Notice that. That's the martyrs we're talking about today. Those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. During the millennium, these martyrs in Revelation chapter 6 will experience the justice and peace that eluded them during their lifetimes. Having been resurrected on the other side of their martyrdom, they will reign alongside Christ during his thousand-year kingdom. That's a reward. Refuge, robe, rest, retribution, and reward. The comfort of their martyrdom. Now all of that brings us to today's final main point. That's the conclusions of their martyrdom. What conclusions can we draw from today's text in Revelation 6 verses 9 through 11? What life applications can we glean from our study of the souls under the altar? Well, let me highlight three lessons from today's study of these martyred Jewish Christians during the tribulation. The first is that God has a plan that includes each detail. God has a plan that includes each and every detail. From this passage, we can take great comfort in thinking about our own physical death should we die before Jesus returns. 
Now, some have suggested a doctrine called soul sleep, meaning that the soul of a person is not actually alive during the time of death and leading up to the beginning of eternal heaven. But that certainly was not the case with these martyred tribulation saints. They were alive and well under the blood, conversing with the Lord while they were in heaven. Now, what happens when a person dies is a topic for another sermon at another time. But suffice it to say here today that at the moment of death, the body sleeps in the grave, but the soul is very much alive, either present with the Lord, if a believer, or separated from the Lord, if an unbeliever. And at the first resurrection, the body and soul of the believer will be reunited as we are raptured with the church. At the second resurrection, the body and soul of the unbeliever will be reunited as they are cast into eternal hell. That's enough for today's lesson. Just know that God has a plan that includes each and every detail. Listen to me. He has your back, okay? He's working out his perfect plan. He hasn't abandoned it at all. He's still in control, sovereign Lord. Number two, God has a plan that justifies each delay. God has a plan that justifies each delay. Delay. What appears to us to be delays in God's deliverance is always explained by his greater purposes which are at work. The martyrs who cried out for vengeance against their persecutors discovered that God had a purpose in his delay. We think that God is uncaring or unconcerned or unjust or unable when he doesn't respond to our needs right now. But he is none of those things. Rather, he is a God who is working out his purposes in his timetable. In the case of the martyrs, justice would be carried out, but in his perfect time. In our case, the answer God gives us may not always be in the way or in the timing that we think it ought to be, but God knows best. As it says here in our text, he alone is sovereign Lord. There is no other. Let's read God's words, his own words in Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. Let's read these out loud together. My intentions are not always yours, and I do not go about things as you do. My thoughts and my ways are above and beyond you. Just know that God has a purpose that justifies each and every delay. Number three, God has a plan that extends to each dispensation. God has a plan that extends to each dispensation. As we read through the Bible, one thing is abundantly clear. God's grace extends to every period of humankind's presence upon this earth even during the tribulation. Isn't it amazing that God is always seeking and calling and extending the offer of salvation? And even in the tribulation, there will be untold thousands who will receive his offer of grace and be saved. But let's not be distracted by the them and the then. Let's zero in on the us and the now. For God has a plan that extends to this dispensation, the church age today, right here and right now, Sunday, July the 11th, 2021. And that plan of redemption is for us. God is extending his grace to you today. And this is your opportunity to seize the moment before it passes you by. Let me ask you this. Are you thirsty? I mean, deep down inside your heart, thirsty. (laughs) It's got to be something more. You're parched, you're dry. Only Jesus can satisfy that kind of thirst. He himself said, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. 
And here in Revelation, Jesus is extending his invitation to satisfy your thirst to you. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. We call it living water. And it's at no cost, free to you. But here's the catch. You've got to drink it. The free gift of salvation is in fact offered, but you must accept it. The, the, you can't just ignore the gift of living water and be saved. Look at Revelation 21 and verse 8. Got to look at this together a little more closely. But those who are ashamed of me, who neglect to believe in me, who sin sexually, who dabble in the occult, who <clears throat> worship other gods and who tell lies... All these have a place. Where are we? In the lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death, which is hell. Now, in the middle of this verse, she already showed it up there, but of all those that are bound to hell is this phrase, who neglect to believe in me. Don't miss that. This is not a description of those who rebellion, rebelliously and defiantly reject Jesus. No, this is the description of those who neglect Jesus, of those who are undecided about him, of those who are indifferent toward him, who neglect to believe in me. This is not a picture of those who refuse the living water. No, this is a picture of those who ignore the living water. Let me put it another way. What do you have to do to go to hell? You ever thought about that? What do you have to do to go to hell? Nothing. That's exactly right. As a sinner, you are already going to hell. You don't have to do anything to go to hell, but you do have to do something to go to heaven. You must drink the living water. You must come under the blood of Jesus Christ and be clothed in that white robe of Jesus' righteousness that we've been talking about today. As John wrote in Revelation 22 and verse 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. That is the city of heaven. And so I ask you this morning, have you taken care of this matter of your salvation? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Now I've got to stop here for a minute and just make it clear that I talk to a lot of people who have done nothing and they expect to go to heaven. More and more in this world I run into people like that. Or people who have fallen for Satan's lie of procrastination. Yeah, I'll, I'll do this, but not today, tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. I could tell you story after story about that. Sadly, people are going to be in hell because they waited for no doggone good reason whatsoever other than their own pride, other than their own selfishness, other than the, they just wanted to run life their way. That's not God's plan. The day of salvation is today. The moment of salvation is right now. You can't just ignore the living water. You can't just ignore the gift of salvation and expect to go to heaven. You've got to embrace Jesus Christ as the Savior and the Lord of your life. And I just say... To anybody who's here in this audience live or who's listening to this online later, what are you waiting for? Amen. What are you waiting for? Will you drink the living water offered freely for you today? A study in the book of Revelation. Today we study the souls under the altar from Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11. In our next lesson, next Sunday, we're going to focus on Revelation 6, verses 12 through 17, in the sixth seal, in a lesson that I've entitled, The Whole Earth 
trembles. <laughs> well, we experienced a little bit of that this last week, did we not? But let me tell you something. That little tremor was nothing compared to what we're going to read about and study about next lesson. You don't want to miss it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It's always so so pertinent and relevant, and it's just right where we are. Your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts all the way through all the stuff that we put in front of it. Gets right to the heart of the matter. And you've done that today, even with the story of these Jewish Christian martyrs during the tribulation who will give their lives, they will be beheaded because of their faith and trust in you, because of their preaching of the word, because of their testimony that Jesus is Lord and their refusal to deny him. We know that we have brothers and sisters in Christ in our world even today who right at this very moment, are under the threat of death because of their faith. But that'll be nothing like what it'll be like in the tribulation. Thank you that you have delivered us from the fear of having to face that because we are yours and, and we're going to go home before this even happens with you. And, and I don't even know how to explain that, the joy that wells up in my heart and my life because of that, God. You are so amazing. But I cry out for the salvation of those who have not yet drank that living water. Those who have not yet placed their faith and trust in you may today... May this very moment be the day of salvation for them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.